And I'm very pleased to introduce Mick West, who um, was an erstwhile video game developer and has devoted, I guess, the last decade or so to popularizing scientific thinking and fighting conspiracy theories and so on. He's the author of a, a very well-received book on fighting conspiracy theories down the rabbit hole, which he held up to me before, but maybe he could do that again. So we can Escaping the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. So we can know that that actually exists. Uh, he um, is has worked uh, to a large extent on trying to debunk chemtrails, which if, if you haven't even heard of those, you should go look up what that is, and you'll discover things uh, by Mick. Um, and latterly, the Pentagon, I guess, released a bunch of UFO videos, which caused a big big splash and people claiming that they were released secretly during the pandemic so nobody would notice or something. But actually, lots of people did notice and uh, Mick spent some time trying to explain why why uh, there are rational explanations for these videos and that's, that's what he's going to talk about to us today. So take it away, Mick. All right. Thank you very much, Douglas. And yeah, I'm going to get to the videos very quickly. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to give you a bit more specific background as to who I am and why I am well suited to doing this. Uh, I am a video game programmer, which you might think isn't particularly useful. Retired video game programmer, and in 1999 I did Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which was a very popular game at the time. But doing video games, you have to be expert in a bunch of things, one of, the, one of which is like 3D graphics, figuring out where things are in 3D space and coding up. Uh, solutions for 3D problems, how to get something from here to there, what something looks like from a certain position, stuff like that. Um, in 2006, after I retired from the video game industry, I started a website called Contrail Science, which was uh, looking into the, uh, the chemtrails conspiracy theory, and I kind of became an expert in, uh, in contrails and identifying aircraft, because a lot of the time people would see strange aircraft in the sky and think it was some kind of government plot. And so I would uh, figure out what it was, uh, yeah, looking it up on Flight Radar 24 usually. In 2010, I founded Metabunk, which is a more general investigating and debunking site. And there I gained a whole bunch of skills in debunking conspiracy theories and uh, analyzing UFO videos using all of the previous skills that I have uh, just outlined, 3D graphics, tracking down planes, things like that. All right, so these US Navy UFO videos, Let's have a look at some historical context. And I'm going to do this in reverse. So we kind of start out in present day and we'll go back to where they actually came from, which it wasn't actually during the pandemic. It was sometime quite a, quite a long time before the pandemic. So the most recent thing was that in uh, August 20, 2020, the Department of Defense announced they've established a UAP task force uh, to study UAPs. Now, uh, UAPs are really the same thing as UFOs. A uh, U, UAP is an unidentified aerial phenomenon, and a UFO is an unidentified flying object. And I guess the phenomenon thing encompasses things like lights in the sky, which might not actually be objects. For example, Venus, you know, even though it's an object, it's really, for most people, just a light in the sky. It's not actually flying through the atmosphere. It's a, a light from some heavenly body far away. So it's more all-encompassing and it kind of loses a bit of the stigma of UFO, which people think of being a kind of an X-Files type thing. Uh, so UAPs, the terms will be used interchangeably here. April 27th, 2020, and this is what we're really talking about, the videos were released. And uh, it even says release right there. Now, they released these three videos, but what actually happened was the videos were already out there, and it says that here in, uh, in the, the, the release that they were actually, had been circulating in the public domain after unauthorized releases in 2007 and 2017. So it's nothing at all to do with the pandemic. They came out in 2017, or one of them actually came out in 2007. So those three uh, US Navy videos are called Fleur One, Gimbal, and Go Fast. Three uh, similar looking, but very different videos, and I'm gonna go, over each one of them. But uh, first of all, like the, the release of these videos created an enormous amount of media attention. And I think this has kind of muddied the water because people 
uh, I've presented these videos as being something, something amazing, something that's just been released, something that the, the, the Navy has admitted is real, and it's like it's, uh, it's, it's you know, it's, it's disclosure, in, to use a, a UFO uh, community term. People think that the government has finally admitted that UFOs are real, but they haven't really. They've just released these three videos. Uh, the most recent of the three videos came out back in March 2018. This was the GoFast video. It was in the, the Washington Post. That's, that's not really that new. And it was actually released by an organization called the To The Stars Academy. And To The Stars Academy is a very interesting organization. It's actually run by Tom DeLong. And if you don't know who Tom DeLong is, he is the lead singer and guitarist for Blink-182, which is a, uh, a pop group uh, from uh, you know, I don't know, a decade ago or so. So he's running this organization with his millions of dollars that he made in the, in the music industry, and he's trying to bring UFOs to public knowledge. Fascinating story, but not what we're talking about here exactly. The real start of this is in December 2017, when the New York Times published this story that said, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program. And they released uh, the other two videos, the one called FLIR One and the other one called uh, Gimbal. And they, they made a big deal of it. They said it was, uh, you know, a revelation that the Pentagon was investigating UFOs and the Pentagon had these, these official videos. Yeah. The Pentagon didn't really agree with them on this because they didn't actually officially release them then. The, the, the official release came later. But essentially, they came out in December 2017. Um, and also in December 2017, that was kind of the founding of the Two the Stars Academy. They were kind of linked together. They coordinated the release with the New York Times. So Tom DeLong was promoting this whole thing. So that's where these videos came from. The first video actually came out in 2007 in the Above Top Secret Forum, which is a kind of conspiracy oriented website uh, from back in the day, a yeah, really, really long time ago, this has been running. And uh, it links to the video and the link actually still works. If you use the archive.org link, the, uh, the Wayback Machine, that video is still there. It was actually released in 2007. And it's the same video as it is today. It didn't get much attention back then because people thought it was fake, but now people know that it's real. There's a real Navy video, it gets a lot more attention. Okay, so before I get to those two videos, I'm going to have a quick look at two older cases uh, that share some of the same features and they're quite illustrative in how, how we should look at cases like this. One of them is the 2010 mystery missile case over Los Angeles, and the other one is the 2017 Chilean Navy UFO case. 2010 Mystery Missile, this was a big deal back in 2010. You may remember it if you are old enough. And uh, someone fired a missile over Los Angeles. Nobody knew what it was. The military didn't know what it was. And they said it wasn't them and they didn't know what it was. They thought it was 35 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. And people were suspecting it was the Chinese doing a show of force. Very dramatic looking uh, footage there of uh, what looks like a missile shooting up in the air. Uh, the media likes to have experts, so they went out and found a couple of experts. They found Robert Ellsworth, the former De Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Tom uh, McInerney, a general and former fighter pilot. And both of them said it is a, uh, a missile. And the general, in fact, was 100% certain. And he said he'd flown hundreds of combat missions, and he knew exactly what a missile launch looked like, and this was a missile launch. But he was wrong. It is, was not, in fact, a missile launch. Uh, it was something I'd seen before because you know, I'm a contrail guy, I'm a contrail expert. So I see all kinds of unusual contrails and I'd seen this contrail uh, the year before. December 31st, 2009, a plane flying towards the camera over the horizon left a contrail which let, looked very much like this one. So I kind of recognized it immediately as a contrail. The task then was to figure out how to show this to people. So you know, to cut a long story short, um, me and another guy kind of tracked down what planes were coming over the horizon towards Los Angeles at that time. We imported the into Google Earth and we uh, plotted where they were. We moved the viewpoint of the camera down to where the uh, uh, footage was taken from. Then we moved it to some guy's house because some guy had taken a whole bunch of photos of this, this UFO. And so we found his house, got the photos, we overlaid them, uh, tracked the top of the track, overlaid it over the radar track, and it was a perfect match. 
match exactly with its radar track. So that basically proved 100% this was what it was. It was just a plane. It was leaving a contrail. It wasn't, in fact, a missile. So you know, the general was wrong. Lessons learned. Lessons learned. Excuse me. Experts make mistakes, even former government officials and fighter pilots and generals. Perspective can be very confusing, um, especially when things are a long way away. Powerful zoom magnifies these, the illusions of perspective, perspective compression. When you're zooming in on something, uh, the, it looks very different to when you're actually much closer to it. So zoom is a confounding factor. The Earth is not flat. Things come over the horizon. They don't just uh, disappear over the, the top. They actually come over the horizon. So that makes it look like it was flying up in the air. Small or far away. Small or far away is uh, a common problem in UFOlogy. When people are looking at things that they don't know what they are and they don't know how big they are, you don't know how far away they are. If you have something that's just like a little black speck just in front of you, uh, you, if you don't know how big that speck is, you don't know if it's actually in front of you or if it's like several feet in front of you or perhaps even miles in front of you, especially if you close one eye, you don't have the stereo vision, you use your camera, which doesn't have stereo vision. Small or far away is a, a, a major problem when people are trying to figure out where things are. The military is not very helpful. Uh, a missile was launched over Los Angeles and yet they were like, mm, I don't know. So... The military is, is hampered because everything they tell the public has to go through official channels. They can't just like look it up on the servers and say, oh yeah, that was, uh, that was this or that. They have, to, they have to declassify everything, essentially. They have to approve it for public release. So when you ask the military something, you're not going to get an answer straight away. And you may not get an answer ever because things may end up being classified by default. All right. Uh, Case number two, the Chilean Navy UFO. This was an interesting uh, case. And uh, it's this infrared video. It's infrared. And in this, in this video, infrared video, black is actually hot. So this is kind of inverted from what you would, you would think of as being uh, normal infrared, where white would be hot. So the, the black objects here are hot. So the thing in the middle of the screen here is actually, uh, it actually a hot object. And... Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because it leaves this, this trail, which is also appears to be hot. So it was very mysterious as to what this actually was. And uh, this is long video and this long, um, long kind of discussion about this. The uh, Huffington Post broke the story and they were very effusive about this. They said this was a, an exceptional nine minute Navy video of a UFO displaying highly unusual behavior studied by Chilean authorities for the past two years. You know, like that sinking, they studied it for two years. These were highly trained professionals with many years experience, and they were absolutely certain that they could not explain what they saw. This is something we hear a lot as well, highly trained professionals, experts can't explain it. And the official conclusion was that it's a UAP, an unidentified aerial phenomena, due to the number of highly researched reasons that it was unanimously agreed could not explain it. Um, that's a lot of convoluted, uh, way of saying they eliminated everything that they thought was possible, so it must be the impossible, a alien spaceship. The problem here is that something I call premature elimination. People like to cross things off a list. So the experts start studying this, this thing and they eliminate all these things on the list. So first of all, they eliminate a plane. Uh, it couldn't be a plane because it wouldn't have shown up it would have shown up on the radar and it didn't. Uh, it would have answered the radio and it didn't answer the radio. Planes don't dump hot liquid. Uh, and contrails, if it was a plane contrail, only form above 26,000 feet and they thought it was around 10,000 feet. So, not a plane. They eliminate a plane. It's not space junk, which seems fairly obvious. You're not going to get things flying out of space that would look like that. It's not a hoax. They analyzed the video, couldn't find anything wrong with it. It's not a balloon because it was moving like too fast and balloons don't spew things out either. It wasn't a bird or an insect. I mean, obviously not. I don't know why they even did that. Not a drone. And the reason for that was that it would have been registered and they would have known where it was. Not a parachute or a hang glider uh, because it looks wrong. And so they, they eliminated all of these, uh, these possibilities. And this, this is an actual photograph. This photograph here is actually this group of people, this safe uh, scientific and military committee 
bunch of people from the military and the scientific community got together every few weeks to discuss this for two years, did a bunch of tests, tried to figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. It took them two years. So they eventually released the story to the Huffington Post. So Metabunk, my website, uh, we did an investigation on January 5th. Huffington Post released the video. January the 6th, somebody tweets to me, uh, at Mick West, could be a plane and its contrail. Now, I hadn't seen this before, so I took a look at it, and uh, could it be? Yes, yes it could. And I, I recognize this as a type of contrail called an aerodynamic contrail, uh, which is a type of contrail that forms at much lower altitudes. Uh, you might ask, you know, what's, an aerod what's aerodynamic about it? There's two types of contrails, aerodynamic contrails and exhaust contrails. Exhaust contrails are what you normally see, it's the exhaust coming out of the engine. Aerodynamic contrails, they form over the wings and they actually form in different atmospheric conditions, and so they, uh, they, can, they can form at a lower altitude. So that was also something that the experts were wrong about. So why is it hot? They, they say, uh, how can it be hot? Contrails are clouds, so clouds will be cold if they're up in the sky. Uh, but you know, two things about that. First of all, look at the other clouds. The other clouds are also hot looking, they're, they're dark. Uh, this one over here is, is as dark as the contrail. And the reason that they are, they are hot is that the sky actually shows up as being cold. If you do an experiment where you take a, a candle and you take a, uh, some ice and you do it against a background like this, you see the candle looks uh, hot and the ice looks cold. But if then you then tilt the camera down so you're looking up like this here, then both the candle and the ice look like they're hotter than the sky because the, the sky is showing up as I mean, off the scale cold because it's not really radiating anything. And the ice itself just shows up as about eight degrees Fahrenheit. So they were wrong about the, uh, the impossibility of a contrail. So what actually was it? Well, if it was a plane, we should be able to find the plane. And we have enough information on this video that we can actually track it down. We have the date and the time, and we have the latitude and longitude of the helicopter. And we know which direction it's looking in because we can, um, we can match the video to, to the, uh, uh, the background. <clears throat> so we looked in planefinder.net. This was you know, several years ago before Flight Radar 24 was recording things. Planefinder.net. And we found there was uh, two planes that kind of fit, fit the bill. This one over here. Iberian 6830, and this one over here, I uh, can't remember what it was, but this wasn't the one. This was actually the one here. We took those planes and we brought them into Google Earth, same as before. And we plotted the tracks, we moved the camera to where the helicopter was, we overlaid the helicopter image, and we looked to see where they crossed. And right here, this green one actually was a match. So we tracked down the actual plane. Uh, we also took it into Google Earth, uh, put in a model of a plane in the right spot, and then moved the camera back to where the helicopter was and saw what that would look like. And you can see it's in the right place, but the image, the black image, is a lot bigger than the plane it actually is. But so why is that? Why is that so much bigger? The reason it's bigger is something that relates to the, uh, UO, the, the Navy videos, which I'm coming to soon, is that it's glare, it's infrared glare. And glare is different from lens flare. Glare is the stray light around a very bright light source, like I say, a flashlight, for example. It's the light around a flashlight. It's not the lens flare, which is uh, something else. Now, uh, infrared glare, glare is essentially the same as... Uh, glare around a light. It's spillover light around an object. Now, it's usually several orders of magnitude uh, less bright than the actual light itself. So even though there's the exact same glare around my finger here, you can't see it because it's so much dimmer than the actual finger. But with a bright light, it's bright enough that you can actually see it. And uh, I did an experiment to demonstrate this. I put four candles, uh, the same spacing as the engines of the plane, and then I took video of it from far away. And you see from far away, you get this kind of blob shaped thing, which is similar to what you saw. But if you start moving closer towards these four candles, they gradually resolve 
into four individual candles. So that shows that when something is far away, uh, it actually looks much bigger in, in the infrared glare. So we've got this big infrared glare covering the four candles. Same thing really as these four engines here. Okay, so it was, it was 100% solved, it was just a play and it was leaving a contrail. So what lessons can we learn from this? Uh, experts make mistakes, even if you have lots and lots of experts. Military pilots make mistakes. The helicopter pilots were accomplished military, military pilots, lauded, lauded by the Huffington Post. Perspective can be confusing again. Infrared glare can hide a plane. Now that's a very important thing because it relates to the, uh, the, the US Navy videos. Radar doesn't help if you're looking in the wrong direction, the wrong location. Yeah, if it's only, uh, uh, if you think the object is 20 miles away, but it's actually 60 miles away, then you're not going to find it. And the same thing with the radio. Uh, the radio, if they're on a different area, they're going to have a different radio frequency. And so hailing them on a common frequency isn't going to work. Being wrong for years does not make you right. They spent two years on this. They got it wrong and they released it and it was disproven straight away, which brings you to the last point, which is uh, ask the internet. Uh, you shouldn't have just this room of experts. There's a huge array of talent out there. Lots of people are interested in this stuff. And if this video had been released two years earlier than it was, it would have been solved two years earlier than it actually was solved. Instead, they spent two years, all these guys, wasting their time, and then they released it when it was solved in a week. Okay, let's get to the US Navy videos. FLIR 1, Gimbal, and Go Fast. I'm gonna start with FLIR 1. FLIR 1 was filmed in 2004. Important thing to note, nobody saw it by eye. Uh, it shows a infrared glare on the camera and then an indistinct blob and it kind of changes the camera a lot. And then it looks like it's making some sudden moves and these sudden moves generally coincide with camera changes. So the question is, is the object moving or is the camera moving? And people who think the object is moving claim that it's moving with incredible g-forces, incredibly high acceleration rates, which it would actually be if these were actual real movements. I think it comes out as something like 70 g's, which is way, way in advance of any aircraft that we have currently. They top out around like 10 tops, I think, or 20 for missiles. Flew one, is it small or far away? Um, this is you know, the big question with UFOs. Is it a small object that is close to the camera or it is a larger object that is uh, far away? We can actually do some math here. We can see that it, if we chop out the image itself, it takes 14 of its own sizes to cross over the field of view. We know the field of view is 0 0.35 degrees. We can divide that by 14 to get 0 0.025 degrees. We can then do a little bit more math to figure out what's actually going on here. The size of something in an image, which I know from my 3D, 3D programming, is the distance multiplied by the tangent of the angle. It's actually two times uh, the tangent of half the angle, but for our purposes, this works exactly the same. Two times the tangent of 0 0.25, or uh, just the distance times angle in radians, if you want to get technical, uh, for small angles. So the size in feet is the distance in miles times the number of feet in uh, a mile. Sorry to use feet uh, for the Canadian audience here, but uh, I'm in America. Uh, multiplied by the tangent of 0 0.25. So that gives a nice round estimate of the size in feet of the object. It's just simply the distance in miles multiplied by 2.3, which is nice and uh, straightforward because we can use that to get some very rough estimates. If it was a mile away, then this object would only be 2.3 feet in, um, in width. If it was 10 miles away, obviously it would be 10 times that, 23 feet. If it's 20 miles away, 46 feet. And now we're getting into the range of actual aircraft that could be, could be the size of a fighter jet. So one possibility is that this is an out-of-focus fighter jet that is 20 miles away. It's quite a long way to see something, 20 miles. Or it could be something like a Boeing 737 that is 50 miles away. Uh, that's another possibility we don't know. Is it small? Is it far away? As well as being small or far away, we, uh, is it small and low or is it big and high? We've got another number here, which is this five degrees here, which is the angle that the camera is looking up at. And uh, if we're looking up into the sky, there's only so high a plane could be. A plane's not gonna be at 100,000 feet, so it kind of gives us some more limits as to what we can actually calculate. 
if the, we know the camera's at 20,000 feet, we have that number down here, and we know we're looking at 5 degrees, so uh, the object is above the 20,000 feet by some math again, distance in miles, times 5280 times sine of 5 degrees, or 20,000, plus the difference in miles, sine is 460. Nice round uh, estimate. So again, we can figure out the various uh, things that it could be. So quite all quite reasonable numbers, less than 40,000 feet, which is like the service ceiling for uh, some aircraft, but some aircraft can go high. So could it be a mid-sized jet, like this one, for example, a 737 that's uh, 40 to 50 miles away? Well, it's black uh, in the video, in the, in the visible light mode, and uh, it's, it's very blurry and out of focus, and it's very low resolution, and it's got a lot of noise in the video, a lot of perspective compression artifacts, uh, and it's at a funny angle. So perhaps, you know, if it's at this angle, perhaps it could actually be a plane. Look kind of similar, and when it rotates a bit, you know, it's just a plane in a different shape. This plane is actually facing the wrong way for the motion of travel, but it's the same basic idea. You just take something like a plane and you blur it enough, and it's uh, it will look like this. So it could actually be a plane. So uh, the big question about this one is: if it's a jet, why does it accelerate so fast? It actually leaves leaves the frame, and you can see it here. I've kind of corrected for the uh, the zoom change in the middle here. Uh, it leaves the frame in three quarters of a second, three quarters of a second, which means, uh, as we know, the width of the frame in degrees is going at 4.3 seconds per degree, which coincidentally is exactly the same rate that the camera was panning to the left. Now, we know the camera is panning to the left because this number here, a little hard to sit, uh, read, uh, moves from one degree left at 44 seconds to eight degrees left, uh, so one minute, 12 seconds. So it's moved seven degrees, smoothly panning from left to right, from right to left, uh, in about 30 seconds, which is about 4.2 seconds per degree. And that was coincidentally the exact rate that we calculated the objects leaving the screen. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, what do I think happened at the end of this video? I think that the camera was following a plane, probably about 40 miles away. It's in level flight, it's not doing anything special. The camera is slowly panning to the left because it wants to follow the plane. The plane is just kind of moving off in that general direction. It's moving very slowly, not, nothing special. But then there's all these rapid camera changes. The, the camera flips between different modes, it flips between different magnifications, and at some point it actually loses lock on the object. And it does this a couple of times uh, through the video. It loses lock, the, you can see these bars widen, and then it regains the lock on the, on the object and carries on. But the last time it just doesn't manage it, couldn't quite manage with all these rapid camera changes. And so it stops tracking and the object just goes off to the side of the screen. And that's all that happened. It doesn't seem like it's really that complicated. And yet I have to fight to uh, get this explanation across because people prefer the other explanation. The plane, I think, is just in level flight, not changing its velocity. And uh, it's not amazing. All right, moving quickly on to Go Fast. We will go fast to the Go Fast video. Go Fast video is a much more recent video. The other one was the old one that was filmed. Uh, 2007, I think, 2004. Go Fast was filmed in 2014. It looks like it's going very fast. It looks like it's low, close to the water. And it's been described as you know, traveling at two-thirds the speed of sound, hauling ass. Is it, though? Yeah, we can actually use some of the information on the screen to figure this out. We know the altitude. We know the speed of the jet. Uh, we also, the altitude is 25,000 feet above the water. We know we're looking down, negative uh, angle. 26 degrees, and we know that it actually gets a radar lock on the object, it's 4.4 miles away. We can do some very, very simple uh, trigonometry with this uh, to figure out how much the plane is below, uh, how, much the, how, much below, how much below the plane is this object, how much down, because we're looking down, 26 degrees, 4.4 miles away. That's the hypotenuse of the, the triangle, so we, use, uh, we just work out what the opposite side of it is, which is, uh, 4.4 times the sine of 26, or 1.92 nautical miles down, about 12,000 feet, and which means the object is at 13,000 feet, which means it's halfway to the ocean, and not very high at all. So they were wrong about that. 
Also, if we know all these angles, we can actually figure out that it's uh, how fast it's going because we know the angle to the left that it is at the start, the angle it is to the left at the end. We know the jet's banking a bit, so it follows this curved path. And we know the range at the start and we know the range at the end. So we can figure out where the object is at the start and where the object is at the end. Turns out the jet moves this much, the object only moves this much. So the object really isn't moving very fast at all. In fact, it's moving around under, under 40 knots, which is about wind speed. We know it's not even very big. We can figure out how big it is, it's around six feet. So what type of flying object uh, moves around wind speed, is a few feet wide, is roughly spherical, looks like a dot, has no heat source, it shows up as white uh, in, in uh, black hot, uh, shows up on radar, and uh, what could that be? It is in fact a weather balloon. Most simplest explanation is this is just a weather balloon drifting in the wind with a radar reflector on the balloon, and uh, uh, that I think is probably all there was to it. Uh, the, uh, the extra thing that you need, as well as it being a weather, weather balloon, is to realize that what you're seeing isn't the motion of the balloon, it's the motion of the parallax. It's a balloon, similar type of thing. The balloon isn't really moving, it's just, it's just floating in the air. But it's being filled from a helicopter, which is moving very fast past the balloon, and the camera is tracking this balloon. So it gives you this illusion that this object is uh, moving very, very fast when it really isn't. So I think that's all we're seeing with the go fast uh, video. Not, not low and fast, it is high and slow, probably a blue. Okay, last video is the gimbal video. The gimbal video uh, was filmed the same day as the go fast video uh, back in 2015, and it shows a weird saucer shape, and it looks like it's flying rapidly over the clouds. At some point it slows down, it rotates on its ends and it stops. And this is by far the most challenging video to explain, so I shall try and get it in uh, <laughs> the next 10 minutes. Uh, is it just a glare? This was my initial idea that I thought it, it was just a glare. Someone showed me the video, and I think you know, the same day, I, uh, I suggested it might actually be a glare. It might actually be an infrared glare. And of course, you know, the reason was I've seen this type of thing before in the, the Chilean case. I've seen that you could hide a plane behind the glare. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it could be a glare, but it's complicated. If it's a glare, like, why is it shaped like that? Uh, why can't you see the plane? Well, we kind of know that it was hidden behind a large glare. Why does it rotate? What's going on here? Why is it rotating? And why does it slow down and stop? And at this point, when it rotates, it, it was flying fast over the clouds, but now it's, it's, uh, it's slowed down and stopped. And why is there a cold aura around it? Yeah, it's hot, it's black hot, but around it, it's white. It's kind of weird. And you know, are we just doing mental gymnastics here? This is something actually Joe Rogan accused me of. He said, I'm just doing mental gymnastics, trying to explain these videos. And it's much simpler if we just go with the, it's anti-gravity explanation, because that just explains everything. Anti-gravity also makes the air cold, apparently. All right, let's do that cold thing first. Cold aura, it's infrared, uh, it's inverted, so that black is hot, and that means white is cold. Is this a pocket of cold air defying all known physics? Nope, it is just, in fact, um, something you see in infrared videos. Here's a hot jet engine, here's white around it. Just something that shows up in infrared videos, it's called an unsharp mask, they use it to increase contrast. Uh, why does it slow down and stop, and stop? Well, the reason it's doing that, I think, again, is parallax. You know, we saw the parallax with the balloon, and here the, the jet starts out flying kind of at an angle. To the object so it's kind of flying with the object off to one side it turns around and eventually ends up facing it so we can kind of simulate that here and i've done that with the jet starting down here it flies up and around and eventually it's facing towards the object which is over here and the clouds over here move as you would expect to start out moving fast continue moving fast for quite a long time longer than you would think i would i would say which way it's confusing and then it slows down very rapidly at the end uh, so that explains why, it's, why it slows down and stops, just parallax, nothing particularly interesting. Excuse me. Why is the glare shaped the way the glare is? Um, it's diffraction and focus. Uh, the shape of a glare is kind of defined by how much the light spills around the object. And if you are a bit out of focus, it will spill more in, in more directions, just from the lack of focus. 
but it also spills due to diffraction effects. And this is why in, in astronomy, you see these spikes on, uh, on, on stars that are actually diffraction effects from the cross that's in front of the, the, the mirror holding up the, one of the reflectors in the telescope. Uh, so these diffraction effects are quite a big thing. So I made this little video with this, this plane with two jet engines attached to it, which are actually flashlights, but they give the same effect in that you only see the glare when the jet engines are facing towards you. And let me just start that. So if I move the camera back, you'll see that a big glare appears, a big spiky glare in this camera. Uh, it's kind of saucer shaped, I guess. But if I use this, this camera, it gives a more saucer shaped glare with, a, uh, with these spikes on it. And you see when I rotate the camera, the background doesn't rotate in this image, but the glare does rotate. So if the camera was rotating, it would make, make the glare rotate. Um, and the diffraction thing, if you touch your camera with your finger and smear it a little bit, it changes the shape of the glare. And what I've been told was that these glares appear in these targeting pods when people clean the front window of the targeting plot pod. And you see here I'm rotating the camera, the glare's rotating, but the background is not rotating. Uh, but you know, is the camera rotating? Uh, I think, yes it is, and we can tell it's rotating because uh, we see these bands in the sky which look like they're rotating. And uh, this is something, you know, I encourage you to look at this yourself, and you probably can't see it in this, maybe in the smaller one, but you can actually see the entire sky rotating, which would only happen independently of the horizon if the camera was rotating. Why is it rotating? It's kind of complicated, don't really have time to get into it. The fine tracking of the image is done with mirrors, there's a coarse tracking done with exterior gimbals, the two big gimbals you see on the outside. Two axis gimbals can't traverse zero degrees when looking around. And I, I do a little uh, demonstration of that here. When I traverse zero degrees, it goes up. So I have to do a rotation of the camera, a quite a large rotation to actually continue tracking. Uh, it's complicated, but yeah, it doesn't require magic. So if it doesn't require magic, it passes Occam's razor. We don't have to add anything. And uh, requiring mental gymnastics does not qualify an explanation if the explanation actually works. It may be difficult, but you can, uh, uh, you can make it work. How do we convey it? How do, I actually, how do I get this across? Keep it simple, not too simple. Don't, don't hide away from these complicated things like the gimbal rotation. Use visuals like I just did. Uh, keep refining the explanation if people don't get it. Ask the internet and incorporate new ideas and information because your ideas will change and you need to be flexible. And don't give up. You will, uh, you will get through to people if you keep trying. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, if we have time, I guess I can take questions. Yeah, no, that was good. With lots of time for questions. Um, let me see. I was looking for any hands up. Um, the usual thing is if nobody asks questions, I have to ask something really stupid <laughs> to, to set the bar low. All right. Um, we did get a, there is a thing in the chat now from somebody who has their own UFO experience. I mean, I guess it's hard to answer without investigating. It's yeah. Probably, it's uh, probably the answer. Uh, yes, indeed. Like uh, people's, people's individual experiences are often right, very personal. And if they don't have photographs or video or images, it's, it's very hard to do anything with a verbal description. And that's why I focus a lot on these videos. Uh, people kind of say, you know, why don't you, why don't you take the pilot's account into, into account? Because you know, people talk about having seen things on the same day, but they didn't see what was actually in the video. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to explain what's in the video. And it's, uh, I'm not saying that this is what everybody else saw. So this, these videos being explained doesn't actually disprove uh, what any in, one individual might have seen. And it certainly doesn't explain all the UFOs, let alone the, the events of the, uh, uh, the Navy uh, encounters. So I guess Riley's asking how, how, I mean, how ultimately, how do you distinguish between a hoax and an optical effect? I mean, I guess, what, what would really convince you that it was a UFO, I guess, is that, that it was aliens? Right? Um, well, I think the gold standard for science is independently verifiable um, experiments that demonstrate or fail to falsify a hypothesis. And with UFOs, 
it's the same thing. I think uh, what you would like, want to see ideally is multiple cameras from I individuals who are not related uh, in any way uh, sharing the same thing. And perhaps also like things like actual radar data. In these cases, people talk about the, there being radar data, but there, there isn't actually any data we can look at. There's just people saying, oh, I remember being there at the time and I saw these things on the radar. Uh, so yeah, we want to have multiple sets of data rather than just one set of data. And somebody asking about conspiracy enthusiasts. So how do you, how do you, I guess, try to convince somebody who doesn't seem to want to be convinced? Uh, you talk to them and you don't give up and you stay polite. The most important thing to do with anybody who is a conspiracy enthusiast, like say a QAnon person, is to keep them grounded in reality. Uh, people often kind of lose, lose grasp of like what's real and what isn't, and they start getting all their information from uh, a source or sources that are not very good. And if you are talking to them now, you might be one of the few sources of good information that's out there. So even though you might not be able to dissuade them uh, from their strange beliefs, just keeping talking to them and talking about things that are real and giving them information that is real in a nice non-confrontational, a nice friendly way, that actually does have an effect. Uh, it can take a long time though. So keep talking and don't give up is my advice.